Good morning guys, this is Mimi Lekachian and today I'm going to present for you kind of new short maybe, maybe long, I'm not sure yet, I haven't decided yet, a series of lecture. It could be called a different way, but I want to call it like learning from me because I want to present a series of lessons, a series of positions or games where I played, let's say, a wicked opponent and you can clearly learn the ideas, the the plans, everything which has been provided by me and I will share with you all my thoughts and I hope it's going to be very important for you. So I'm going to make a break from uh, my previous uh, installations, from my previous lessons regarding calculations. I'll give you some break and from now on I'm going to talk about position of play. In fact, I would like to talk about one particular subject for now. I guess number one chapter, we'll talk about prophylaxis. Very first game which I'm going to present to you, it's actually one of my most freshest game. I just played, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, week ago, depends on when is this uh, session is going to be installed online. I played against, you know, an uh, expert in LA who is actually an expert for many years, Jeremy Stein. Uh, white pieces. All right, I guess that's the first first question here. So what white should do? This is old, actually it's not old, it's actually more than a Karukan. Has been um, invented many years ago, but I guess has been popularized by Anatoly Karpov, who started to play this opening line uh, very consistent back to late 80s, uh, early 90s, because Karpov used to play particularly only one line, exclusively he played Rio Lopez, and then since he started to have some problem against Gary Kasparov in Rio Lopez, and some other grandmasters see so how they possibly could beat Karpov, so Karpov invented this new opening for himself, and uh, basically he switched from Rio Lopez to Karo Khan. And he actually switched from one particular line, maybe the seven, I guess uh, as a most famous experience for, for Karpov, he could recall by making him play against Gatakamsky in the matches. So I put here net FT. Why? Because I'm playing expert and try, uh, I mean, obviously I'm trying to stay away from uh, all this, like, you know, top fashion lines. Not because I'm afraid. No, I know, like, uh, one of the uh, funniest lines is here to play this. Out of idea, for instance, to meet this by jumping over here and uh, trying to explore this diagonal, you know. And I know the main line is, let's say, this. Then we have this. Again, black can't play h6 because for the same reason. And white will get at least a pair of the bishops. So black has to be careful by playing this. And the last chance was still playing this. A uh, famous story when uh, Gary Kasparov lost himself as a black to to machine deep blue when he forgot to play bishop b6 and he played h6 and after the net a6 he found himself in big trouble because after let's say queen e7 castle we deal with a big problem because all these pieces are completely like you know miscoordinated here. So, queen on f7, bishop on f8, queen on f7, king on d8. So, all these pieces are completely bad, in bad shape. And it's hard for black to, you know, finish development. And Kasparov eventually lost this game. I think it was game 6, if I'm not mistaken. So, main line again, bishop d6, this. And... The game which became so popular back then, it was this, this. Kamsky played here queen h4, and after king h7, suddenly his queen become a problem, a target, and it you know, takes a uh, while to give up the pawn to save the queen. 
It's still, by the way, some compensation. All right, but just compensation. In fact, white doesn't need to play that way. White in this line particularly can play queen e2 and still holding advantage here because they have a center pawn on d4, they have a little bit more space. So for some people who like to play this way, they're welcome, it's nothing wrong. So, but I wanted to play something else, just stay away from the theory. And after this, I simply played the knight f3. Well, the line is still uh, makes sense because even I kind of said I played one move and two move and three move, you can say this is wasting time. I would disagree with you guys because I have a space, what has a space, and one of the rules uh, for sides who has a space, it's, uh, it's controlling the pieces, meaning not trading too many pieces. So by making that g3, I'm actually trying to keep my pieces in a game as more as possible, not g3. Now, next rule, bishop c4. Why it's a rule? Again, nothing wrong pretty much to place him here. But in general, we would like to keep in this cases bishop on c4 for two reasons. Firstly, it's not covers white's queen to you. And second kind of reason, most of the times when you have a pawn on d4, especially when that pawn is isolated, you would like to have your bishop on the diagonal next to your pawn. It's in general rule to support eventually to play d5. So pawn dark, bishop light. Pawn light, bishop dark. So that's kind of a positional tip. It's important for you to know. And that's why I like to play here. And also, in some ideas, since we have this disconnections in some ideas my bishop could be actually looking for creating some pressure on this to a subject so bishop c4 by my opinion the best move again typical move queen e2 why it's typical because i know one thing i understand Black will try to play c5. Black will play c5 and black will strike my d4 pawn. At some point, d file could be open. If d file could be open, I don't want to make a trades or have a potential trade situation with my queens. So I would like to keep my queens in the game. Plus, I'm still looking maybe possible shots on this by this diagonal. So Queen e2 is very, very, very important. And now it's a very interesting moment of the game. After cd, which by my opinion at some point should be done, or the best by my opinion to play a6, game in fact goes from Karakhan type of pawn structure to French defense. Most likely we talk about Tarash type positions, you know, uh, line e4, e6, d4, d5, knight, d2. So when I played this position, I actually knew these kind of tricks and I wanted to go there because I thought not actually every Karakhan player knows how to play French. And that's exactly true, at least regards this particular game. My opponent clearly made inaccuracy here by playing knight b6. Now, firstly, why is inaccuracy? Because this guy gets bad position for himself. And now they're following the wrong plan. Now they played here queen c7. Well, I thought black has obligations here to actually capture on d4 and then eventually by trying to improve the knight and hoping to uh, make this bishop moving forward eventually after maybe this or maybe still hoping to play e5 at some point. So this is clearly a wrong idea, by my opinion, because I have this. Well, the point of this move, you always read your opponent's mind. Always try to understand what he wants. And clearly what black wants to do is to play c4 and then play this guy here. Have fantastic combination between these two pieces. And then run with pawns and try to strike my foundation my of my chain kind of foundation our foundation is obviously on b2 
but uh, it's hard to be attacked. But C3, it's easy to be attacked, especially by having this pressure from D5 knight to C3 square. So clearly, I can accept that. And but what I saw is this. And now we're trying to attack the position of enemy king. So you see what I did? I made the release, which again, it's a very important positional moment. We always saying, I've been always saying to all my students to hold tension, all right? To hold tension as much as possible, as long as possible. You only can release tension by making this kind of moves if you are getting concrete benefits. And by me, I did it. Actually, I have some benefits because the queen has been deflected from a central area, and it means the king side pretty much become a little bit weak. Plus, the bishop left his original space, I mean place, and now after bishop g5, I'm going to attack the king side. So clearly, if I will take on f6, it's not, it's not acceptable. So clearly, black has to react, and reaction. I guess should be either going back here or moving the knight. On move bishop e7, my intention was to play rook a d1 to make an improvement. And let's say if bishop goes on d7, then I prepared a very nasty move, not on h5. Again, benefits because the queen left d8 square and no one guards e7 bishop. And I can handle this move by creating more pressure on these two subjects, and I think here it's going to be very dangerous for black to continue playing. So I found that stuff, my opponent chose here knight d5. And after this, now in one of my plans, by the way not everyone maybe knows this, in some of my plans, besides of still hoping to attack inside, it's actually to attack the square right here so how it works well clearly i would have attacked this guy so clearly i understand this guy will go back on his seven and after capture well i was expecting to be honest the knight knight takes his seven in some lines i'm going to consider playing rook a d1 or even rook f d1 and then trying to jump over here and by support of this guy eventually and this guy so I'm going to have a huge, huge play on the queen side. How do I know this? Well, the pawn structure told me because I have three on two on the queen on the queen side. Plus, this pawn structure could be appear from many other openings, including even king's Indian defense. So previous experience of playing these type of positions kind of telling me what should I follow, what should I play. My opponent played here a different plan. He played queen e7. His strategy was kind of simplification and trying to simplify the game and maybe hoping for draw. But the problem of the strategy is next. When I kick c4, well now this guy has to go here. Again, I'm sure white could be playing uh, with many different ways. Uh, like uh, I was considering bishop c2, rook a d1. But I think I found, uh, by my opinion, the precise way, at least by me. So I played here, and here, at the time when I, I was capturing on f6, I simply asked myself a question. What should be the best dream for black to play in these positions? Well, clearly they would like to finish development because they have a problem, and this guy not playing any so far, right? So, in these positions where we have 4 versus 3, I mean, I had explained to you in my previous lessons for sure. In fact, if you even take a look at one of my most recent lectures, when I described my game against Gregory Kaidana from US Championship, I said this pawn structure design for each side who has majority of pawns, try to play there where it's supposed to be. It means black should be playing on the king side. But for them now to play e65, it's almost impossible. It's very really hard. So I guess the first the first priority for them is to complete development. So I knew they want to play bishop e7, right? So I knew that. Well, clearly my kind of responsibility to find a way either to stop it, 
because if I'll stop it, I'm going to get big advantage or, or to be ready for that. And in fact, if you will keep looking to that direction, okay, I guess first, first you will find nut e5, kind of stopping this because of c5, but then you figure out, well, he can play knight d7, I keep challenging me by simplifying his position. It doesn't really good, doesn't really work very well. If you play c5 straight, at least he can play, let's say, a knight d5, and I know this is, could be better for white, I agree, because I said pawn, but bishop still working, uh, bishop still doing okay, so it's not what you want. In fact, another reason why c5 could be an issue, because let's say I can play this and this and that and blockade the pawns, all right? So all those things push me, if you again apply principle of prophylaxis here, you will find amazing move, simple and amazing, simple and strong. How that move stops bishop d7? I mean, you don't see it, right? But think about it. It's very simple. A rookie one, double up this, and bishop d7, I play c5. Now, firstly, d7 square took away from the, from the knight, right? In a game, my opponent played here knight d5. Well, clearly, if you're going to play knight c8, then you're not in big trouble, and white could do many things, including knight d5, and that's clearly better for white. If you play knight a4, tricks, kind of tricky move because attacks this, attacks that. I have counter trick. And now suddenly this guy in trouble because you can't take by queen because I take your guy here. If you play, if you play this way, after this you resign because I have interfered your diagonal and attack your bishop and this guy's gone. So it means you only move here, it's a b5. And I think after c6, it's almost resignable because I want to block, I mean, interfere this diagonal, right? And no matter how you play, I play this, defend, attack, followed by capture. I think just simply bad, pretty much losing for, for black here. My opponent chose this. And the main point of this small little move rookie one was to go for better pawn structure and not just pawn structure because queen is seven. That's the whole idea of rookie one. That's how rookie one stops bishop d7. Because remember one important rule. Most of the times when you have better pawn structure, you're always fine with simplifying position because better pawn structure less pawn islands will give you better chances to win a game in deep end game so you see if you think about i said i didn't want to play let's say this move at he in here because i simply don't have 27 move i know i'm going to get better position slightly better position let's say i can play queen d2 Stay away from possible pin, and black could, I don't know, jump jump somewhere with the bishop, and then I can put my knight here. But it's still going to be middle game, while it's still going to get better. But it's a question if they can actually win this game. All right? In my way, what happened in a game, right here, right here. In my way, this is clearly wins. I mean, not wins, but much better situation because we're going to simplify the game. In my thoughts, I thought uh, this is the main response. But again, this is very bad end game because after this, I don't think so. It's it's it's, hard. it's it's going to be possible to hold it. In my lines, I thought the only move to play like this and to go for that end game. But I think this is like clearly better for white. I would say in my level, it's almost winning for me because I have beautiful knight, uh, better pawn structure, and bishop on the seven quite uh, useless. 
I mean, it's possible if Black can hold it, but you have to be like a strong grandmaster to really understand all those uh, details and to be super patient to actually hold this game. If you can. Again, if you can. So, my opponent chose here to play a natural, kind of natural. Uh, he made here move uh, rook ad8. His idea was try to keep at least one pair of the rooks in a game, which is also makes sense. And here I applied a second time, same principles, prophylaxis for this game. Now let's think about it. By the way, why I took it on e8? I had to kind of, because otherwise black rook goes on e5. So I really had to trade this, this guy. And now let's think about it. by position, white clearly winning because they have better pawn structure, less islands, better knight versus bad bishop. So it means the only way how black could possibly survive by keeping activity. And uh, typically, uh, activity comes always from the rook because we all know the rule: if in a game one rule, one rook in a game, the value of position comes from value of your rook first. So rook's activity, number one priority. Next tip we know, it's a situation when bishop and rook versus rook and knight, typically side who has a bishop and rook would like to keep these two pieces particular in a game because they hate to trade the rooks. Combination between rook and bishop, it's always better than combination between rook and knight. Not always, but 90%, put this way. So my job as a white in this case, make sure the black rook will never get any possible activity, will never bother me. So I guess the first option for you, because you can see clearly this guy controls this, this guy controls this. So I guess the first to make sure this square on d4 will be untouchable. I guess your first option is to play f3. Control this. Plus, you're saying, I'm going to play king f2, defend that, defense is this, defense is this. So all these squares are pretty much taken from black rook. It means, eventually, you can simply play plan A, proposing trade. Plan B, you want to play rook c1, keep your rook behind your pawns, and then start to push your pawns on the queen side and try to create a passer on the queen side. When you play f3, you're responsible for one move, for one particular move. You have to calculate, and you must know certainly, certainly what you do against this move. Well, he wants to play this, rook d1. Well, again, I'm showing this move in, uh, for you, but I suggest you guys as exercise to find my thoughts right here, right here. Why f3 is the best move? Now you know f is the best move, but how f3 actually, how you will stop his activity after rook e3. Because I'm not going to say like, you know, what to do after bishop a4 or rook c8. All those moves are simply bad. What you're responsible is make sure you find a way to deal with rook e3. And now look at this, what I did. Rook d1 must be done to defend this. And on bishop a4, on bishop a4, well, what's the point of bishop a4? Well, clearly, if I move my rook, this guy comes here. If I move my pawn, I lose c3 square axis. But from far, you're responsible to see this interesting shot. Then you can say, oh my god, this is blunder because he can take on f3. And it looks like black won the pawn. Well, if you take by knight or by, knight or by king, I mean, you are losing the pawn. But what has been missed by my opponent, And black simply lost here. Black simply lost here. My opponent made a couple extra moves, but I'm not going to show to them because this doesn't make any sense. I think it was just uh, desperate and kind of angry, maybe a little bit. And he made like two or three moves and then he resigned. But the point is, what happens here, it's again, it's simple prophylaxis. By knowing what to expect, by understanding what black you need to be played 
you actually found a way to prevent it or to be ready. To be honest, to be honest, at the time when I took only eight, I didn't see this part. I didn't see it. But as soon as I took it on the eight, and I took my time here to double check myself, only here I saw this King F2 trick and GF trick. At the time when I was capturing on E8 and I knew I'm going to play F3 anyway, I didn't see I have this trick. In fact, even if I would have that trick, position F3, F3, it's still bad because I have to tell you something. Even, even this is bad for, for black. Even this is bad for black. Because it's usually this pawn structure, it should be very difficult for black to handle it because I have better king. I can have this plan, I can have this plan, and then regroup with my pieces. You know, this is, should be bad as well. Anyway, so I hope you like it. I hope you like it, this uh, short lesson and you understand these positional tips regards planning, position of play, structures, and most importantly, regards prophylaxis, how we apply these principles in our thinking process. So I hope you like it, and I'll try to continue talking about the subject, position of play, prophylaxis, you know, improving our positions in our next uh, several lessons. Unless if you will tell me this is a bad series of lectures and I should get back to calculation or something else. All right, guys, talk to you soon, and have a great day.